Good now. Switched over, had to switch over to OBS because apparently Streamlabs still needs some work. <laughs> oh, you love to see it. Oh, there's one more thing I need to do to make this official, and that is start captioning. This way, if people want to watch who are uh, hearing impaired, then they can then they can read my or if they have a or if they would just like to read the subtitles, then there are subtitles now. I have no idea how good they are, but I'm trying. Mm, pardon me. And I wanted to get a quick stream in before I had to leave for work uh, because I missed last week due to the eight hour birthday stream that was intended to be 12 hours. And in the meantime, I did watch a couple of new movies. So I have a much more robust review slate here. So let's head on over to the theater room and switch up the poster. Because the first thing we're going to be talking about is Dune. Uh, I had never really seen the uh, 1984 Dune. I still haven't read the book. The uh, I have seen like numerous uh, numerous um, reviews of the movie, and so I've gotten an idea of the storyline from that. Because they're you know people will compare it to the books and then, um, you know the the, the storyline is fairly much the same. Uh, this time around we got Denis Veneuve, uh, who I know many of you know probably from Arrival, but he's also done Prisoners and there was something else. There's something else he was doing. Oh, I also do want to make sure I have the right info. Yep, uh, looks all good. Okay. Uh, I, he's probably, I know him best from a, uh, Arrival and Prisoners, but he's been an indie darling, I'll call him. I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, he also did Blade Runner 2049. Uh, oh, he's Quebecois. I did not know that. Quebecois? How would you pronounce it? He's from Quebec. And, um, he also directed Sicario, and the Jake Gyllenhaal movie Enemy. Uh, he has, he has had some, I believe, French language movies before. Because he had, yeah, he, had, apparently he directed, he's been directing since 2000, at least. Uh, his first major motion picture, like his first feature length, seems to be in the seemed to be in the '90s. So we're just now seeing him bud into Hollywood. He's been making uh, French language films for two decades, <laughs> at least at least almost two decades, fifteen years. Uh, but yeah, Veneuve is an interesting director. He's very much an artiste. Not in, the, not in the negative way, where it's like he forgoes story for visuals. Because he's been able to tell really solid stories, but makes great use of the visuals. And I think this Dune actually kind of works for him. Sorry about that. Just every so often, people try to call our house, and I don't. And most of the time, it's just telemarketers. Um, but at any rate, Dune uh, is an inter uh, It's probably a good story for him to take on because it's very robust. It's a very heavy story in terms of like lore and world building and whatnot, and that's kind of a good thing. Like, Veneuve did great with Twenty Forty Nine. And Arrival, I think. It, I swear to God, next time I'm just going to unplug the phone. Just so it shuts up, because I don't need it down here when I'm streaming. 
Don't need to know when the telemarketers are calling here. Aye. Um, but, yeah, Veneuve, I think, is a good fit. And the cast here is just top tier. Because we've got... Uh, Paul Paul Atreides being played by Timothée Chalamet, you know, the very indie favorite actor. I think he does better. I think he does well here for a Paul. He definitely does better than I've seen Kyle MacLachlan do as in the role. I think, and and we're really going to see Paul step into his own uh, in future installments because this is done well enough that I think they're going to keep going. But I'll get into. Um, that in a bit, but we got Rebecca Ferguson as his mom, uh, Jessica Atreides, Oscar Isaac is Duke Leto Atreides, Jason Momoa is one of the uh, security team, Duncan Idaho, you've got Stellan Skarsgård as Baron Harkonnen, which is great because he gets to be all fat and bloated looking and floating in the air all the time, uh, Josh Brolin is the role that, uh, that uh, Patrick Stewart played. In the in the eighty four movie Gurney Halleck, the uh, he's another sort of security uh, team leader, and even, and even going down to like character actors, you've got um, Stephen McKinley Henderson, uh, who who has been in things from Lincoln to Fences to Lady Bird. You know, you've seen him, you know his face. He's a, he's got a distinct look about him. He's a he plays the advisor to the Atreides family. You got Javier Bardem as the leader of the uh, Fremen, and then you've got uh, Dave Bautista as Beast Rabin Harkonnen, one of the sons. And uh, Zendaya is Chani, but we'll get into the, her in a bit. The thing about this movie is, it's a lot. It's over two hours, I think. I want to. Is it? Is it two hours or? over two hours two, thir two hours 35 minutes and yet it's not the full book kind of a spoiler but if you've read the book you'll watch the movie and be like that's not the whole book that's we're not even done yet there's that's kind of my biggest issue with it is that we don't get the full story but that means that part two when it comes out because I'm assuming he probably filled them Lord of the Rings style back to back and then just cut them into two parts just for time's sake rather than to try and cram everything into like a three hour movie. And that means next, the next part is going to be the climax and it's going to be the, it's going to be absolutely insane as we see Paul rise into his own and whatnot. But here we get a lot of build up. And we got a, we we get a lot of a lot more introduction into the world of Dune. We get to get, you definitely get an understanding of the political layout. The fact that the Atreides know that they're going into a trap by accepting this position, and that they know that they also can't refuse it either. And then the assault on the capital of Arrakis, where they and by the Harkonnen, is absolutely brutal to watch. It, it Veneuve you, makes great use of the visuals to make that uh, assault on the capital look just, just, just sad, just depressing, as you know, it, it, as it should, because it's a destruction of an entire. You know, it's an assault on a city by an army, and it should look terrifying. But um, I, I, the cast really enveloped their roles. Oscar Isaac is great as Leto. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson is great. I couldn't remember who she was. I didn't know if I recognized her from anything else. Uh, but she is fantastic as Jessica Atreides. And Javier Bardem is has only a couple of scenes as the leader of the Fremen, but he's great. He's fan I didn't even know he was going to be in the movie, honestly, because I didn't see him advertised. I saw more bits of Batista than I did of Javier Bardem. But yeah, both everybody in here does great. Even the character, even the actors you don't recognize or don't know, like um, the ones playing uh, the doctor who work, who's there to help them. Uh, to help, who becomes part of the uh, 
the Fremen in, ter- in in order to study the planet. Uh, she, she's pictured there on the poster next to Momoa. I, the actor's playing like the Herald or the Reverend Mother or the Emperor. All like every actor in this movie does a good job in their role, and even like even though some of the characters don't get to do a whole lot because they're featured more in the second half of the story. They are, the actors still do fantastic in their roles. And I think with the, with four, with almost 40 years of tech advancements, we definitely see what some, what the original film tried to do. Because if you've seen the original film, you'll recognize things like the, the light shield, like, you know, like these various different uh, effects that they tried to do. Uh, it's interesting because they downplayed the um, the box. Because I remember in the first movie, the the, the whole box where Paul has to um, ha- he has to stick his hand in and never show fear. It's actually smaller in this. Okay, no, I'm thinking of something else. I'm, you know what I'm thinking of? Because the box is about the same. The one in the movie is a little bit smaller. It's like half the size, but same thing. Okay, it's same thing. What I'm thinking, I think I'm thinking of the the thing. Is it from Crawl? Nah. What what movie was that from? There was like a there was a. There's a sci-fi movie that featured this thing that you stuck your arm in and it was supposed to, like, either test your will or something like that. Um... I have no idea. It'll come to me at some point. But, um... Yeah, so the... So the yeah, the... You'll recognize bits and pieces. If you've seen the first movie, the the one from the 80s, you'll recognize a lot of the same stuff, but they're able to do it with a bigger budget and expand more on it. We get to see more of Arrakis and understand some of the ecology of it, like the fact that the Harkonnens brought over palm trees and, are, and they're forced to try and keep the palm trees alive. And, uh, yeah, we get to, you get a little, hit a little more taste of the, of the politics going into it, but it's hard, but it's so subtle that a lot of people aren't going to notice it. They're not going to understand the, um, the, um, you know the the vaster implications of it, just because one, it's hard to get into politics in general for for a lot of people, and two, you throw in fantasy elements, and it's harder. It's even harder to get involved. And number th- and for this and in this particular case, he plays everything to the you know to the vest, close to the vest. Nothing's very broad or cartoonish or over the top, but but I do think it's a very well handled. Uh, take on the material, and I'm very interested to see what he does in the in the second part of it. But what we got was still it looked absolutely gorgeous. The he made great use of the of the desert landscapes and of the sand and of the and uh, of the aesthetic. The aesthetic looks weird and and neat, uh, like they're weird like water suits that have to take that take their sweat and uh, water droplets that they breathe. And recycles it so that they don't lose water. It's all very interesting stuff. Uh, the spice itself is like is showcased in the form of these little sparkles that happen in the air. Just they're just it's just floating around. It never really it it doesn't really get into the fact that spice is essentially an allegory for oil, but it definitely emphasizes the fact that the Atreides know that the Fremen are the indigenous people of this planet and they're being exploited by the Harkonnen. And that's going to be interesting. And the only the only concern I have is something that stems all the way back to the book, and that is Paul's, 
place as a white savior for the Fremen. It's emphasized more now because it's a much more diverse cast of characters. Like the Fremen are much, you know, there's a lot more um, non-white actors in the movie in various roles. And the Fremen themselves, from the book and from the names, all take inspiration from Arabic and various Middle Eastern uh, areas. So Herbert was very on the nose with the fact that this was basically an allegory for America and Britain, uh, inv British involvement in the oil drilling process and taking a resource from its indigenous, pe from its native people. And... It's very curious to... I'm going to be very curious to see how Veneuve handles the white savior motif in the next part. Because that's when it's going to really come into play. And he may be able to handle it, play it off, and make, make better use of it by maybe downplaying Paul's role as, like, the savior. Maybe it's like he is their savior because they believe in this religion and Paul accepts that and is more willing to just assist them. But I don't know. There's, it's going to be interesting the way to in, in, to see how Veneuve handles that sort of trope, just because it's it's part and parcel of the story. You can't tell the story of the first Dune book without dealing with the white savior trope. I mean, you could. You could make Paul non-white. But even then, it's still kind of like the outsider saving the indigenous people from themselves. It, it, that's always been a bad trope. Even going back to like stuff like Dances with Wolves or a or Avatar, it, the movie, the cat movie, not the not the Airbender, but yeah, I'm very excited for part two. Dune is Dune is very quickly leapt up in my one of my favorite stories, and the only reason I don't absolutely love it is because it's only part of part one of the story. I need to see the other part to know, in order to know how to feel about both. So we'll see how part two goes when it comes out. It also turns out that I could see another theatrical release in at home because Dune was on HBO Max. Halloween Kills was on Peacock. I did not know this until I until I took I saw it being advertised, but apparently Halloween Kills is over on Peacock Premium. Remember Peacock? It's NBC Universal's streaming service, and that's where they took the office off of Netflix. <laughs> but I think it's starting to come along. I'm gonna check out. I'm, I'm gonna check it out again now that I have a month premium because I had to re had to pay for it in order to test out um, in order to go see in order to watch uh, Halloween Kills because I had already used my um, my my. Um, what you call it, uh, uh, trial, my trial week, and I didn't feel like su trying setting up a whole new email just to get another trial. But Halloween Kills is the direct follow-up to 2018's Halloween. And it's interesting. A lot of the same uh, people, David Gordon Green and Danny McBride are back behind the camera. Jamie Lee Curtis is back as Laurie Strode, and a, a couple of the original actors from the 1978 movie are back as the survivors. And plus, you got Anthony Michael Hall as a new character. He plays a a town member of the uh, of uh, what is this place called? Whatever, whatever the town in Illinois is uh, that they that they that they live in. He's a uh, he's another survivor, and he. He wasn't direct, you know, he's another guy who's like friends with the survivors and he's very much not into the idea of falling into the fear of Michael Myers. And um, it starts right at the end of the first move of the of the last movie where they set the house on fire. But we see that the fire department has come and EMS has all come to to put out the flames instead of just letting it burn and killing Michael and we see that Michael got his way out and just starts going on a slaughtering spree. And what's interesting is, I don't remember seeing this, but it, uh, I don't remember seeing this in other Halloween movies, but Michael actually starts leaving bodies out for people to find. And he's like playing weird little games with the dead bodies. It's kind of 
off-putting and weird, and I dig it. It's a it's an interesting uh, character characteristic and personality they've given to Michael for this. And then they also flash back. They start off by flashing back to 1978 and showcasing you know some of Michael walking around uh, before he attacked Lori, and then even and then had a confrontation with the police before being captured. And this movie's a bit hit and miss. On the one hand, it's it ta- it it tackles some interesting aspects, like the idea of forming a posse and having mob justice against Michael Myers, and how that can lead to just outright paranoia and hysteria, and you know, like a mass hysteria. That that all is good. And, uh, you know, you, you have uh, some characters dealing with guilt of, we should have, you know, we should have done this years ago, it's all my fault, that sort of thing. And then you've got, but then you've got a lot campier stuff. Like, there's a there's a gay couple that shows up, only you know, later only to be slaughtered later on. They're not in one of the initial victims, but they're just, they're, you know, they're just there as the people living in Michael's house. And then you've got campiness with, like, this black couple who's a nurse and a doctor who meet some of the survivors from the 78 movie and want to help them in fighting Michael Myers. And there's a whole bunch of really stupid deaths and quick cuts. It seems like they're trying to hide. I don't know. I want to say this is R, but this may be PG-13. If it's R, it has no reason to make use of those quick cuts unless the MPAA is really that petty about blood and gore. Which they could be. They could very well be. Mm, where's... Where's Halloween Kills? Hmm. Hold on. Let me, I'm trying to see what uh, rating it had. Um, in the meantime, Lori ha- has had to go to the hospital, and while she's in a drugged out and tired state, she thinks Michael's dead, and she actually talks with the sheriff, one of the, sh- you know, this character, the sheriff that they introduce, who, not a sheriff, he's an officer, and he had attempted to shoot Michael in 78 and missed, and... And so he lets Michael, li- and he's kind of part of the reason that Michael lives, because he he feels responsible for the death of his partner. And you got Judy Greer returning, and Andy uh, Matichak returning as uh, Laurie's daughter and granddaughter. Something threw me off. One of the old doctors and uh, what not uh, doctors? One of the officers in 1978 is played by a guy named Jim Cummings. As far as I know, no relation to the voice actor. He's just another actor named Jim Cummings, and uh, he's appeared in. He does some visual effects stuff. He's apparently di- directed this this thing called Thunder Road back in 2018, and he did The Wolf of Snow Hollow. So he's a he seems to be an indie horror director and an effects director. <laughs> But um, he just shows up as... So it's like Jim Cummings. Like, like the voice of Winnie the Pooh and Tigger? Is he in the movie? Nope. It's not him. <laughs> uh, different guy. Completely different James uh, uh, Jim Cummings. No, it's an R-rated. So yeah, there's no reason for it to have these really stupid quick cuts to try and hide the violence. Unless the MPAA said, that's too violent. As though we couldn't handle it. <laughs> you know... Usually they only are that concerned about sex stuff, not violence. But, uh, yeah, Halloween Kills is very interesting because it's got, the the writing has some very interesting ideas behind it. And Anthony Michael Hall does a great job as this guy forming the posse and leading the charge against Michael. And this idea of collective grief affecting a town. There's so much good idea work here. But then it's goofy and campy and the and the kills can be sometimes silly, and then it kind of undercuts what it's trying to say by also being a goofy, campy slasher movie. So I think it it struggles a bit between wanting to be taken seriously and going to some darker and more interesting areas and wanting to be a goofy, campy slasher movie. But I think it handles it overall. Both, both, both parts work well, 
And it's just a matter of making the two work together that it doesn't quite uh, make the, you know, that it doesn't quite do well. But the parts individually are all solid. If you like the last Halloween movie, I have no doubt that you'll probably get uh, enjoy the hell out of this one. It really, I think it honestly is one of the better entries in this franchise, just because of, it, of the interesting places it goes and the things it does. You know, especially with the posse aspect and the idea of people outside of Lori suffering from Michael's. Well, people outside of Lori and like like the town in general. Although I haven't seen the the older the other movie, so maybe that is a thing. But yeah, I really dug Halloween Kills. The last two I'm going to cover are from Netflix. As I'm trying to go through them, I didn't. I watched them a couple weeks ago because I stayed last week. I stayed entirely off of Netflix because of uh, well, most people wanted to take October twentieth as the day to stay off of Netflix. I just took the whole week because one, I don't really watch Netflix anyway, and two, uh, I. You know, if I'm going to show solidarity that way, I'm going to do it more than just a a single day. I feel like that's more appropriate than just, hey, let's take a single day off. Why not more? Well, because we don't want to miss anything. Because that's the thing is like I posted on Twitter on my personal one, I think, that if we're going to go off, why not just take the whole weekend off? Because the weekend is going to be where Netflix wants your views because that's when the new stuff comes out. But mm, nobody listens to me. I'm a nobody. Anyway, uh, this one comes from uh, Alexandra Aha, who's who's best known for Haute Tension, uh, the French horror movie, or I guess thriller, maybe? Uh, And then the Hills Have Eyes remake. He's been steadily, you know, he's kind of returned to being more independent and making a more French language horror and thriller. But apparently this was originally planned with Anne Hathaway, who had to drop out, and then that was she was replaced by Numi Rapace before ending on uh, Melanie Laurent and it being just a full-in French film. And what I liked this time around is that the movie is in default French when you watch it on Netflix, and they don't try to overdub it. <laughs> you know, nothing against dubbing, but uh, sometimes it's better to just watch the thing in the original language and then read some subtitle, you know, and then if you want to know what's going on, read some subtitles because you can always pause it at home. It's harder when you're trying to watch it like live. But yeah, the premise is in the distant future, the, uh, we, this woman is stuck in a, it's a claustrophobic bottle film. And this woman is stuck in some kind of pod that's slowly losing oxygen. And she has to find a way to get the oxygen back into, you know, back up and running or get somebody or somebody to come rescue her. And then slowly it started, it slowly reveals as it go as she's investigating what's going on, what exactly has happened, what exactly happened to her and how she got into this pod. The explanation is kind of weird. I won't spoil it, but it gets super sci-fi, which I didn't see coming. And... It's very interesting because you see her hallucinating from the lack of oxygen and, you know, she's freaking out because she's having trouble and the AI is so deadpan and unhelpful at points. But the effects are all excellent. And I, you know, if you're going to watch something for like a thriller, you know, especially like if you want a claustrophobic thriller in the vein of uh, Buried or... um, that's another one. There's another one that was kind of like this, where it's just like, you know, a single person stuck in a place and then trying to get out and then it's all claustrophobic and whatnot. That's great. This is a great entry in that sort of genre. And Melanie Laurent carries this movie. And I, I feel like Anne Hathaway and Numi Rapace would have done well in the part as well. But Melanie Laurent, Laurent just carries this movie and you really feel her fear as she is freaking out over what's happening and just trying to piece all the, you know, get all the pieces together and fig- and realize, and then when you realize what's going on, it's like, what? And then you realize we're, okay, we're heavy into the sci-fi part. And um, that's all I'll say about that. But yeah, Oxygen, highly recommend, worth watching on Netflix. The other one I watched on Netflix was not as worth watching. And that would be Awake. Awake is the latest is a vehicle for Gina Rodriguez, 
who most people probably know from Jane the Virgin. The idea isn't too bad. The idea is that a sudden EMP, some kind of some some kind of event happens, and people have to cannot fall asleep. They are stuck in an awake state, and how that slowly starts to deteriorate your mind and your body. The problem is the characters we focus on are not very well developed. There's some interesting places that they could go. The idea that Gina, that Gina Rodriguez is this veteran who's being, you know, who's forced, you know, who's kind of, at, you know, who's also addicted to painkillers, I believe. It doesn't really develop, once again, it doesn't develop that. They mention she's an addict. They don't mention what she's addicted to. Uh, she steals drugs from work to give to, where she works at a pharmacy before the event, and she sell, steals drugs to sell them so that people can deal them on the streets. And... Then that's all dropped because once the event happens, then none of it's ever brought up again. None of it's ever brought up again. <laughs> and it, then it starts going some in, it, like it start once again starts going some interesting places, like the idea that um, this local church, because apparently they only reveal it when it happens. But um, I think they kind of try to mention it, but. Uh, her kids are in custody of something they call their grandma. I don't know if it's a foster carer or if it's their actual grandma or what, because once again, nothing's developed or elaborated on here. But um, apparently, they the grandma takes them to church, and when the fa when they find out the girl falls can fall asleep, she's treated as like a miracle child by the church, and that until one of them leads a mob. To be like, if we sacrifice her, maybe we can sleep. I don't. How is that supposed to work? I don't know. I don't know. Let's do it because we're a crazy mob. Uh, it's like this one shot of random naked people just standing in the road. And roving gangs of released criminals. In, you know, in this one city when they're trying to escape. And then the eventual explanation for how they fix it is really stupid. Because I'm pretty sure that would also mean that Gina Rodriguez's character would would be able to sleep as well, the way they explained it. But, yeah. Th everything about this would only work in a movie that has better writing. The writers here never really explored the implications of what they're talking about. Like, they want to talk about how the brain kind of, you know, the more you're awake, the more your brain starts to you know, struggle to keep things running and how it, and how your b physical body will start to deteriorate. But then none of that's really seen. It's only mentioned. And then it's more often than not, it's just people going crazy from lack of sleep. Um, and once again, the idea that nobody could fall asleep except these kids would be a good, would be a perfectly fine premise Except the writing isn't there. Like, I had my complaints with Bird Box. This is like an even worse version of Bird Box. Like, if you liked... Like, you could reasonably enjoy Bird Box, even though that's kind of stupid the way they handled the premise. Awake isn't even as good as Bird Box. And I didn't enjoy Bird Box that much. I thought it was kind of stupid. But Awake is just... You know, we have a cool idea. What should we do with it? Absolutely nothing. Great. Fantastic. So, yeah, I don't... I, I, I don't really see this as something you should check out. Like, there's way better... Like, you'd be better off to watch Bird Box than this. There are way better attempts to try and tell this sort of sci-fi story of, like, a, a pocket, an apocalyptic event happening that don't involve th this kind of, you know, weak-ass writing and the acting is all... Is not, not, isn't very good throughout the movie nobody's very good in this movie not that they're given much to deal with and do you know to work with anyway but yeah awake is just not a very good movie i'd say just skip it you're fine you're better off watching anything else really but yeah uh i'm gonna try and get some more that should do it so i'm gonna try and get some more of the uh of my catch-up list done because i've got a whole chunk i still need to watch on netflix i've still got like a dozen at least on amazon and then on hulu 
And now that I have pre Peacock again, I need to see what's on Peacock. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I will be trying to catch up still on, on at least some of the bigger stuff from 2021. The big name, I'll try to find some of the bigger names, but yeah, this is, th this has been a, he a hectic uh, time frame because I just started working again. And so I'm trying to find stuff in between my work hours and, uh, still trying to deal with, as, uh, if you saw earlier, the the absolute shit show that was uh, me trying to use Streamlabs. And yet Streamlabs is, I think, going to be better, a better option for games, but I need to make it work. So that's going to be my thing for the next couple of days, is trying to make that work. But uh, I'm hoping to finally get a schedule going and get back up and running and be a streamer, at least part-time. So... That's it for now. I'll see you folks later. Bye.